Hello and welcome to Mind Talk. Welcome back to an episode of Mind Talk where we talk about all things mind and, and uh, mental health and well-being and, uh, and beyond. Today, I could not be more excited to have with me Kim Addis. Kim is the, she is the CEO and founder of Frame Mind Coaching and Journal Engine. She has a podcast of her own, which I highly recommend checking out, which is called Resilience Radio. And uh, in full disclosure, I, I've produced it for the past couple of years. So, uh, but it is really an awesome podcast. And I do also recommend, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about Frame Mind Coaching. We can talk about Journal Engine. But today, uh, first of all, Kim, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited Thanks. to be the guest now. I know. I've never. We don't, we rarely ever do this. I don't really ever interview you. So, I'm I'm excited to uh, talk to you about this. I mean, we're talking about a subject today that you have. I think you got me to think about death and dying and talking about death and dying in a way that I've never really thought about before. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is really how do we talk about death and dying? And you know, I am a therapist. I mean, I did go to school for this stuff, but. You know, I still have a level of discomfort. And so let me explain to listeners how this came about, uh, how this conversation came about. Your mother passed away, um, is it a couple weeks Early now? January. Early, Early January, January, so more. Yeah, so, okay. And, you know, I said something to you, like, sorry for your loss, which I'm sure you heard from a lot of people. And you, know, you said to me, like, don't be sorry for my loss. Like, that's not what I need to hear. And... You know, I think there's like a couple of phrases people use when someone dies, you know, sorry if you're lost, they're in a better place. Uh, my condolences. I, what is it? Condol my condolences. And you pointed out that there's a real problem with, with that. Can you, can you share a little bit of like kind of what you said to me? Well, you know, it's, a, it's very interesting because for me, you know, there are some major life events in a person's life, Right. You have a baby, that's a major life event. You have, um, you get married, that's a major life event. And when someone really important to you dies, that's a major life event. Except it's the only major life event that nobody ever wants to talk about or ask questions about. So that's right. if, if I told you, hey, Doug, guess what? I just got engaged. You might say, wow, amazing. How did it happen? Where did he ask you? When are you getting married? Do you think it's going to be a big wedding? Like You're asking me all the questions because you think it's an exciting event. And yeah, I really want to talk about it. And I want to share it with people who matter to me because it is a big event in my life. Well, guess what? The death of someone important to me is also a big event. And I also want to talk about that. And it doesn't have to be a terrible, horrible, awful, scary conversation. And the right. thing is that when, when you say, I'm sorry for your loss, like, I don't even know how to answer that. Right. Well, I'm sorry <laughs> for your loss is like, I don't, I mean, on some level, let's be honest, it's really what I'm saying is, I don't know what to say. I don't want to talk about it. So I'm going to say something so I can get away from you as fast as possible so right. that we can avoid this conversation. Right. I can acknowledge it and, you know, be respectful, but I really am scared to talk about it. Yeah. And so in a way, when you say I'm, there's lots, like, I'm sorry for your loss is loaded in my opinion, yeah. because it's loaded with um, like this simplistic statement. Right. Yeah. And, and it throws the ball in the court of the person who just experienced the loss the loss, the loss. I'm saying that in quotes. Yeah. And then this person goes, thank you. Now what? Conversation's over. There is no discussion. There is no opening to share what's really happening or what that experience was like or what it feels like or what it means to you or anything. It's over dead end, dead conversation. And while I, as the mourner, like, I, yeah. I don't even know what words to use, right? I appreciate that you've acknowledged it. Now I feel kind of like this feeling of like this empty black hole, right? Yeah. Like this, this feeling of, okay, so what am I supposed to do with myself now? I have all these emotions, all these thoughts, all these stories to tell, and no one's there to capture them or listen yeah. because people are too afraid of this subject. Yeah. So it leaves you feeling a little empty, right? Well, so I want to ask you a question. You know, I originally said something about, I was going to title it like grief and death or something. And you said, why does it have, to, and I didn't, by the way, I remembered that. And you said, why does it have to be like grief? Why are you making an assumption about my experience? So I actually want to ask you, cause I haven't really had this conversation with you. And I, I actually wanted to wait because I figured we could have it and other people could benefit from it too. Um, what was that experience like for you uh, of your mom passing? So, and again, I'll tell you the story. My mom was this extremely passionate, vibrant, electric woman. 
She was a person who was super warm and engaging and you walk in her house and you just feel this warmth oozing out of her. And the first thing she does is she feeds you with mm. the most incredible food. She was a powerhouse. Like she, she came to Canada from Egypt with no education and wow. worked her way up to becoming a bank manager. And for her and her generation, that was a big deal. Women were not bank managers. No, in her generation, no Women. chance. Um, and her English was broken, you know, like she, you know, but she had this energy about her uh, that was just infectious, but hard to deny. Right. There was just, she was just a very, very special person. And then um, in her mid seventies, she uh, started to lose her memory and she had Alzheimer's. Yeah. So for the past 10 years of her life and my life, I just watched her decline so dramatically that the person she was, was really no longer right. Like she just, right. they say uh, they call it the long goodbye, right? It's uh, you're, you're losing that person. Right. Yeah. Right. And so my, you know, what I would do is try to get glimpses of her, her essence anyways, as often as I could. And so for me, like my, again, while she was alive at the end, like, so my dad died a year and a half before her, then we, she, ha she couldn't manage, she had caregivers, but they couldn't manage her by, by themselves. And so she went into a nursing home with full-time care. So she had the care of the nursing home plus around the clock care because she could not be alone. Um, and, and I live in Toronto and she lived in Montreal and I would call her every day at six o'clock. I had an alarm on my phone saying, call your mother. And I'd call her on the phone and she couldn't communicate. She had no language skills anymore. She had no verbal skills. So every day at six o'clock, I would sing her a series of songs. I remember and, you told me this. Right? Yeah. And sometimes she'd sing along. So at the end, basically the news came in. It was kind of like over New Year's, that period that basically she wasn't eating anymore. And we knew that, like, how long can a person go without eating? Right. So she would have like a quarter bottle of Ensure and that was it for the day. Like, you can't survive off of yeah. that. So I understood like, okay, we're, this is the end. Yeah. So like, first of all, it's weird to get notice, right? Right. It's not like, it, you know, it's coming, it, which yeah. is not always the case. We don't right. usually, yeah. But at the same time, you have to understand, like, I would go into Montreal every three, two to three weeks to go and see her. And, and each time it was just worse and worse and worse and worse. She was fading and fading and fading and fading. And, you know, I'd come home and people would say, how's your mother? And I'd say terrible. And it sounds like a horrible thing to say, but that's how but it was. was. But right. It was terrible. And, and yet they didn't see me like in distress, you know, like I wasn't torn apart on the outside, but on the inside, I thought to myself, like, this isn't a life. There's right. no quality of life here. Right. And it's not such a terrible thing for her to go. Right. 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 It's, it's not because this, if she saw herself, right. Her younger self, she her probably younger would self, say, I want to pass. I want to go into the next journey. She wouldn't wanna... be able to take it. Like she wouldn't be able to handle her lack yeah. of independence and just the yeah. degradation that just, that sh she lived in her later days. And so, so when she stopped eating, I went into town and basically sat by her bedside for yeah. five days and and she just she she was literally in bed at the end asleep not eating not drinking not anything and you know uh the doctor so I went in on Wednesday I sat Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday Monday my schedule was I would get there at basically 7 38 in the morning I'd stay till lunch leave go grab a bite to eat come back stay till dinner go grab yeah. a bite to eat come back stay till about 10 o'clock and then go home and repeat every day, right? Yeah. But on Monday, when I went in, like you could see her breathing was getting heavier. The doctor came in to see her and the doctor said, um, this could go on for days. And in my mind, I'm like, how? How can a person live without food or drink? How much longer does she actually have? Yeah. And that day at lunch, I didn't leave. So I asked my husband to go bring us some food because I wasn't leaving. Yeah. And then my brother and sister were there and they were coming in and out that day. and. At around quarter to six, they both came back and they said, you have to go. Like, you can't just sit here all day long. You need a break. Go for a walk. Go grab a bite to eat. Like, go. What do you think is going to happen? Nothing's going to happen in the next hour. There's not going to be any change. And I was really, really reluctant to leave. But I had this massive headache. And I thought to myself, okay, this is going to be a long night. And I need to just 
go I take, yeah, a I need bit to take care of myself. myself exactly yeah so that i can prepare for this long night ahead and i was ready like we were going to stay there all night if whatever like we we're just there we weren't moving anyway I, we left the the room and i told my husband alan i said look i'm not going to sit down for a meal let's just go pick up something fast and come back and literally a minute away from her nursing home was like a grocery store and that grocery store had like a takeout food, you know, like mm -hmm. you just put it in a container and you go, we put our food in a container. We paid the phone rang. She died. Wow. So I, like, I was yeah. broken up. I was devastated. Yeah. Why? Because I wanted to be there. I did not want to miss the moment. Yeah. I wanted that, with that every, specific moment. Yeah. I wanted with every ounce of my being to be there for yeah. her, for me. And I missed it. And so my instant reaction was just to get super mad that they, you know, urged me to go take a break. Yeah. And that I followed that. I was just like completely destroyed, devastated, unbelievable. And so, you know, we went back to the room and she was there. And, you know, there's a whole procedure. You have to wait for someone to come and declare death. Right. And, but I was sitting beside her and I kept touching her and I kept saying, still warm, still warm, still, still warm. <laughs> and, That's so you, Kim. <laughs> yeah. And, and there were like weird things about like death. Have you ever seen anyone physically die? And what is that like? Sure. So while she was asleep, her mouth was like open, right? But when she died, her mouth just shut by itself. Yeah. So that was, I thought, very odd. And, you know, yeah. stuff we don't talk about, right? Stuff we don't talk we about. We don't talk about. We don't see death. We don't, you know, the, uh, we, we have such a, obviously, I think, you know, it's, it's our own anxiety, right? About, because we'll all die. Like, we don't want to talk about that, but everyone we love and ourselves will die, right? And, and whatever our beliefs are about what happens after that. But it will happen. Like that's just everybody and, dies. No one escapes. Right. right. And we don't want to. You know, I almost wonder. And I, I have no idea. I'm just throwing this out there. But I know you were so upset about your mom passing while you were gone. But I also almost wonder if, on some level, she was just hanging in and hanging in because you were there. Like I almost wonder. So a lot of people say that. I, I have no idea. I'm just making this up. I'm just throwing. So it out. I don't know how polite it is to say, but I think that's a bunch of BS. Okay. So a lot of people say, oh, she was protecting you. And I thought, okay, she's protecting me, but not my other two siblings. Like, I don't really. It just I, was timing and it just happened. It, timing. It happened. So I do believe. So it took me maybe 36 hours, if I were, if I'm going to be honest, to kind of process everything that happened. Sure and get rid of the anger because it really wasn't serving me. It wasn't yeah. how I wanted to experience this. It wasn't how I wanted to be around the subject of my mother and her, her death. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a little bit of time to kind of come to a place where I said, okay, I don't know why this happened. I don't know why it happened the way it happened, but it must have happened for some reason. Maybe it's because I had to talk to you today about the subject, right. but I need to get to a place of peace where Okay, like divine intervention, whatever just happened. Well, happened. I may not understand why, but there is, but some, there's some reason. Exactly. So I, um, so I basically kind of took a took a deep breath and let go of that frustration, that anger, that hurt, that disappointment, like devastation is the right word, and yeah. just said, okay, like now I need to focus on the funeral, the eulogy, all that stuff. I have to focus on that. And I just need to be totally present for that. How long were you there with your mom's body? I guess for lack of a better term. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So, so she passed away at around like six so five, something like that. And it took about uh, three and a half hours before someone from the city came to sign um, declaration of death papers. Wow. So let me kind of give you the scene. And they sign the papers, but her body's still there. Okay, so let me so just- it's not like she back. goes the minute they sign the papers. No, so, so we're sitting there it was me and my husband, my sister and her husband, my brother, his daughter, my niece, and the two caregivers. So it was like, what, nine people, something like that. Nobody had eaten and she's just there. And we're, we start talking and we start talking about like some of the cool things she did in her life. Like- you know, just how she was, um, you know, feisty and how she fought the system sometimes, you know, and the yeah. different things. So they were telling stories and I realized like, hey, if my mother were here, she'd want us to eat. So yeah. I used to come 
every two, two to three weeks and fill up her closet with whatever, all the junk food that I could find that she was able to chew and swallow, you know, chocolate chips, whatever, anything that would go down. And at that, at the end, we didn't care what she was eating, just to eat anything. Right. right? Just get some calories. Yeah. Yeah. So I opened the closet. I took out the cookies. I took out the chocolate. I took out, I took out everything I could find and just like, here guys, let's eat. So we're sitting around her dead body and we're all telling stories and having a little snack. I mean, it wasn't dinner, but it was a little snack. And there was like a bit of a surreal feeling around that just because like you're right, sitting like, with a dead body, yeah. right? right? But at the same time, it was so appropriate. It was like a moment where, you know, there was, there wasn't sadness. Mm. There was just like this recognition that we all experienced this really incredible person in our lives. And that in this moment, right, we're, we're being exactly the way she would want us to be together right. and eating. Right. Right. It would have made her happy. Like if yeah, she's looking down, her happy. Exactly. Yeah, it would have made, made her happy. Then after they came and signed the declaration papers, uh, literally two hours later, they came to take the body away. And that was really weird. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. What? So uh, this is a, maybe a morbid question, but like, what did they like get a gurney? Is it like, how, how, how yeah, did... so they bring a gurney and the gurney has wheels on one end. So at the top of the head, it yeah. has wheels in addition to normal gurney wheels at the bottom. Yeah. And they literally took her sheets. She was in bed. They took her sheets. They took everything with her. They covered her up with the sheets. They lifted her up, put her on the gurney, and then they rolled her away. But why are there wheels at the bottom of the gurney at the top of the head? Because the gurney doesn't fit in the elevator. They have to stand her up. So they strap her in, right? They strap her in so she doesn't fall out. Like it's a seatbelt. Yeah, yeah. You know? And then they have to put They have to turn her so she's like, you know, vertical in the elevator. So it's all very, like, very clinical in a way right it's a right. body at, well, at that point it's exactly yeah it's it's you know and, a couple of things that uh, one thing i'm thinking is as you described your mom and how she was in life it helps me understand you so much better too <laughs> yeah so 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 just to kind of fast forward so now yeah. like you know i'm jewish and in the jewish tradition you have to kind of go through the process it's as very fast quick. as possible so yeah. we had one day to plan the funeral and then the following day was the funeral so she died on a monday wednesday was the funeral you have one day to write your eulogy go yeah and how is it possible to first of all your 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 emotions your mind is all cluttered and messed up like it's all cloudy and you have to think clearly and it's very hard to do very very challenging to do Plus there is a limited time frame. So, and how can you take a whole lifetime and boil it down to a four minute speech? Right. It's really hard to pinpoint and narrow in on all the things. And plus you just forgot. You just spent like the past 10 years of your life looking at her decline. Your memories yeah. of her wellness are a little faded. Right. You forget the person that she was, the person yeah. you described to me, the bank manager, the woman, you know, who was so you, dynamic. And you don't forget like the the generalities, you forget the specifics. Hmm. Right. So you forget, yeah. like, I'm trying to remember a story or, the, yeah. you know, whatever. And it all becomes like uh, hard to access is really yeah. the right word. And for me, like the backdrop of it was this devastation of missing the moment. You know, and, and some people, ha- I mean, I was there for while she was alive. I missed her death. Yeah. Okay. At least I was there while she was alive. But, but, no, said, but that makes sense. Like I wouldn't get any of that if I just give you the, you know, I'm sorry for your loss. Like that helps me understand so much better now. It's like you weren't upset because, I mean, obviously you're upset because your mother died, but really is more, I missed the moment. I missed the moment. Had you been there in that moment, you would have had a different experience. Right. And, and you know, let's just talk for a minute. Uh, and I know we went to eulogy. I'll come back to that in a minute. But um, this whole idea of, I'm sorry for your loss, like the word loss doesn't feel good, right? right. right. So what did I lose? I right. lost a human body, but uh, she's not lost. We know where right. she is. We know where she went, more right. or less, right? right? Like we, like the word You didn't loss, misplace her. 
yeah, we didn't misplace her. So the word loss just troubles me. Like it's part of life. People die. And, you know, people have different ideas about what happens when someone dies. Right. You know, I prefer to say, okay, she's still around, not physically, but she's yeah. still around. Yeah. You know, I can access her somehow. Yeah. I can sort of start, I can have a conversation with her in my brain and I know yeah. how she would respond. I yeah. can hear her, right? Yeah. So uh, she's not lost. Right. She's lost in the traditional way, in the physical sense, but right. she's not truly lost. And for me, that gives me a lot of comfort. So yeah. I'm sorry for your loss kind of leaves me going, okay, I guess I am I have a loss now. Wow, that's bad. So it adds <laughs> something. It makes you feel worse. Makes me feel terrible. Yeah. Right. So like, and, and the word condolence, like don't people get condolence prizes when they <laughs> yeah. don't win the first prize? <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Prize? I'm like, what kind of word is that? What does yeah. it even mean? Right? You know, what's funny. I bet you, if you ask people, what does the word condolence mean? Most people would not even be able to give you an answer. I don't know. But, uh, and I'll tell you, like for me, I got a couple of emails from people, like from some of my cousins yeah. that said, you know, really sorry to hear about your mom. Okay, fine. Um, I remember when, right? Like just, yeah. I remember, like I remember telling yeah. people about how I have this really cool aunt who's a bank manager, or I remember yeah. the story she told me about that. Like, that's the best email you could get. Yeah. Not, I'm sorry for your loss. Yeah. You know, and if you didn't know my mother, like, it's okay to ask a question or two, or it's okay to say, like, right. some people said she must've been amazing. Cause I see how you turned out. Okay. So that's a really nice thing to say, but okay, I'll take it. You know? Well, it does. As you're describing her, I'm like, it's like, you're describing yourself, you know, <laughs> the things you're saying. You've so, never been I mean, to my house for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Even the thing about, you know, not, I could so see you like just being like, you know, one day, many, many, many years into the future, you would be so happy if people were eating, you know, like you'd want people to be eating like that's so a hundred percent. Like I've told my kids about the funeral I want to have, like there has to be music and lots of right. food and it's got to be fun. Right. Right. And, and it can't be sad. Like remember, why it does well. death have to be this terrible, awful, terrible thing that we can't talk about that we have to shove away as quickly as possible. And, and like you said, then it leaves the person who um, maybe their loved one died. Like, it leaves them feeling so empty because you can't talk about your... I think the worst part about somebody dying yeah. is the loneliness you feel when you can't talk about it. Yeah. That's the worst. Yeah. It's not the fact that this person died and is lo no longer. It's the fact that you're left by yourself and you can't really express any of what you feel. What would you say? I mean, I, I think you kind of have... I just want you... I think I have an idea of it, but I want to be explicit for our, our listeners. Like, so let's say it's somebody who doesn't know your mother, right? Let's say it's somebody that knows you well, but doesn't know your mom. What, what would you say would be helpful? It, it's not sorry for your loss, not for your condolences. Yeah. What would you, what would you say would be more helpful? So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to like create two categories. One is the conversation category. The other is the Facebook category. Okay. Got okay? it. So th the conversation category is, you know, so, so what happened? <laughs> like, right. Your mother just died. What happened? What was that experience like? Tell me what you just went through. When did she die? How did she die? Were you there? Was yeah. it hard? Yeah. You know, how did you feel after she died? Those are good questions. Get curious and actually you know, ask some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like I had a friend over like a couple of days ago who knew her and his question was, what was the funeral? Like nobody asked that question. Right. Like right. what? You ask about the funeral? Who right. asks about funerals? Right. Well, right. You would ask about the wedding. Right. Right. You That's would right. ask about the baby. What was the birth family? like? People talk about that stuff all the time. But nobody said what was life. the funeral like? Right. 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 And what are your traditions? Yeah. How do you deal with death? You know, Irish people have what do they call it? Wake. Irish. Yeah, the Irish wake, and you know, yeah, they celebrate. So, life. so what do you guys do? What happens right. after? Right. There's a million questions you can ask. Now, Facebook is another story. Oh, my God. Facebook is terrible. having a conversation on right. Facebook. So you might want to, instead of writing your traditional, like, one sentence, maybe send a message. And if and and for me, I don't ever want to say, like, you know, sorry for your loss. If there's a picture, I want to say, wow, she was beautiful. Or right. if there's or if there's a picture, you look just like her. Yeah. Or if there's like a little description, she sounds like she was an amazing person. Yeah. Like something about her, something yeah. about you. 
but definitely not sorry for your loss. Yeah. And you just get, you know, I, I, I was one of those people, by the way, I'm, I'm fully, I fully am. Um, and that's why I wanted to do this because I learned something. I won't do that again. Like after this conversation with you, Kim, I really, it really changed my attitude and my own beliefs and thought process. Like it made me examine it and I won't do that again. Like next time that someone dies around me and I have to talk to someone, I won't say sorry for your loss. And I hope that people listen to this and take that away. Like, I think there's a lot to, it's, I think you're just one of those people that you call it like it is. And you say, you say it how it is. And so many people just don't do that, but I can't imagine how many people feel the way you do. I'm sure most people who go through a loss like that, I've been lucky enough in my life not to have too many. I mean, I don't want to say that, but you know, um, I haven't had a lot of, a lot of deaths in my life around me. So I don't have as much experience with it. Um, but I'm sure lots of people feel the same way that you have. Like, I feel alone in my journey. I feel just like I can't talk about it because nobody is giving me the opportunity. Right. And, and for me, you know, like I was in Montreal for a few days afterwards, I came back and like life goes back to normal and you're like, hold on a minute. It's not normal yet for me. Right. You know, your life went on, but hold on a minute. Right. I need a moment. Yeah. You know, I need to kind of sit in this spot, not a spot of self-pity, but just a spot of reflection, of looking back, of understanding, of processing, of feeling it, of reflecting, of really enjoying the the life that that my mother designed for me, all that kind of stuff. Just give me a moment. I'm not ready to move on yet. Yeah. Right. What what has it been like since, you know, uh, it's not been very long at all. I mean, it's been uh, like, what, like less than two months. Um, how are things different now? Like, what has it been like since you, I know you're back at work, you're, yeah. you know, you on one level, you're, you know, you're back into your life, but what, what's different? What has it been like since, since your, your mom died? So for me, like, there is a lot of still that weirdness around people where they don't know what to say that, you know, like yeah. people who, oh, Kim. yeah. So there's still a bit of weirdness, um, but I had this very interesting conversation with my daughter and I want to share it because I think it was amazing of her. So, uh, you know, like I came back and she's at school, she's at university, she's got a lot going on, exams, uh, like she's working in a lab, she's got, you know, she moved to a new apartment, just like a lot of things going on. And so the minute I came back, I would talk to her on the phone, she lives in Montreal, and it would be about her. It would be about her. And I'm the mother and I'm supposed to listen to my daughter, right? Like that's what right. mothers and daughters right. are supposed to do. And I have five kids, by the way, and she's my youngest and she's the only girl. So at, at one point, you know, maybe two weeks after the event took place, this was going on pretty close to every day, two weeks. And I just felt like this hole, like this, this, this hole inside of me. And at one point she's like, so like, you know, you know, how, how are you doing? I'm like, to be honest, like I, I am struggling a little bit, like nobody's really there to listen. And she's like, well, what about me? I'm like, not really. And it was a really honest conversation. She said, you know, you're right. I'm, I'm not doing a good job of asking about you. And she's yeah. 19, you know, and, it's, like, and your mom, like your job, you're, you're, you're not a person, your mom. Right. <laughs> right. And she said, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a better job. That's great. And like now I'm getting emotional. I can feel it, right? But the maturity she demonstrated in that moment by just saying you're right, like you're, you know, like uh, you deserve a little bit of TLC kind of thing. Yeah. Was like such a, in a way, a magical moment. Yeah. Because from then on, you know, like I still talk to her every day, but there's a part where she says, how are you? Yeah. Oh, you know? that's so sweet. And so, you know, so what did it do? It gave us, I mean, we were always very close anyway, but it gave us a, an opportunity to kind of, you know, take that relationship to a new place. So that was, that was amazing. Wow. I, I've definitely teared up several times during this interview, but they haven't been, but it hasn't been like, obviously I didn't know your mom. So it's not like, you know, it's not that it's more just, I think it's just the, I think the love and the like joyfulness and the family, like all that stuff came through. So for me is more about that. Like the, I think that's kind of what, um, because, you know, I come from a large family and I kind of can relate to some of that, you know, we all would be eating and 
you know, <laughs> and also Jewish family. Um, I, ah, boy, you know, I, I just appreciate, I just want to say two things. One is I want to say this on air to say, um, I apologize, honestly, about, for, for my response, and because I had that response and, um, you know, just, just really thoughtless and just doing whatever I've I been doing. I don't think for... it's thoughtless. I think it's what people think of as protocol. Yeah, it's just programming, right? We're, we're just, we've programmed ourselves to do it. And if we don't stop, that's what I think this is a really, really powerful thing. I just want to thank you for your willingness to come on and talk about this, your vulnerability. And, um, and yeah, and just, you know, I, I think it takes a lot of courage. I mean, this is how you are anyway, but I think it takes a lot of courage to just tell the truth and be like, this is bullshit, you know, like, but I know that's how you are in every area of your life anyway. So, you know, that's, and actually it's a good segue into, um, you know, so I want to thank you for that. Cause I think really, honestly, I think this will impact a lot of people. And, and that's why I wanted to do it. Cause I, I really feel like all those people who are lonely and sitting there and want to talk about their experience, we need to do a better job of, of making a space so we can actually talk about these things. Yeah. Let people tell their stories, their experiences. It's Kim. healing. It feels good. Kim, speaking of stories and experiences, uh, let's give a plug first for Resilience Radio. Uh, the um, Do you want to say a little bit about the that podcast and what it's about? And So, yeah, I mean, the focus of the podcast is to look for extraordinary people who have gotten to their extraordinary place by going through a little bit of adversity. And so you know, I'm really interested in how people think and how their thinking leads them to handle the tough stuff in life. And so that podcast is really about extracting how how really phenomenal leaders think and how listeners can maybe adopt some of that thinking to overcome their own adversity. And uh, I think we I think we've done over what hundred and I'm trying to think how many hundred and forty episodes. So lots of great stories in there. I definitely encourage people you can check it out on um, at frameofmindcoaching.com. Also anywhere that you listen to podcasts, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. Uh, let's also want to make sure before we leave that you explain to people as well, what is frame of mind coaching? And also if you want to say something about journal engine as well. So what is frame of mind coaching? We coach the highly driven population. And what we do is we, we examine how they think and how their thinking impacts their outcomes. So we have people who are super successful and super frustrated. They might have conflict in their lives. They might have trouble recruiting and retaining people. They might have, a conflict on a personal level. They might feel frustrated with the ability to reach a goal. They might bump into the same problem over and over and over again. And our philosophy is that your life professionally and personally is really a reflection of the way you think. And very often in coaching, coaches try to help you modify your behavior in order to get other goals, to attain other outcomes. And for me, I don't want to modify your behaviors because before your behaviors comes your thinking. So first you think, then you behave. And if we don't address your thinking, nothing ever really changes. And so my job is to help you line up your thinking with your ultimate goals, whatever they are, personal or professional, and help you reach your goals with ease, with peace, with joy, and, and really clear off all the crap from your runway so that you could take off and, and, and enjoy your life. People focus so much on actions and all the actions will, will I mean, I've learned this from, from knowing you for, <laughs> for a while now that, yeah, it's our thinking that determines all the rest of that stuff. First our actions we look, think, then we behave. Then we behave. Yeah. Journal Engine, do you want to say something about that? So we use Journal Engine as an in-house product that we built and we use that product for our coaching process. One of the things we do is we ask our clients to journal every single day with their coach. So it's a very intimate and uh, intense experience. Uh, but Journal Engine is the product that we also license out to other coaches, speakers, trainers to have them journaling with their clients. So journalengine.com. And Frame of Mind Coaching. So Frame of Mind Coaching, we'll send them to frameofmindcoaching.com and journalengine.com. Yeah, and if you want to experience what we call the magic of Frame of Mind Coaching, That's right. like come to the site, set up some time to talk with us and experience it firsthand. Kim, thank you so much for coming on today. And like I said, thank you for your courage and vulnerability and just your willingness to be yourself. Thanks for <laughs> asking the questions. Thank you. Yes, I finally did. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, everyone. We'll be back next week with another episode. Bye, of everyone. Talk. Take care. Thank you.